Hey guys, in a previous video I did, we talked about the burnt offering and what that means. And the fact that that means we give ourselves in total surrender unto the Lord. And how we just give our whole life that we die to self and we live for Him. And today we're going to talk about the grain offering. So we're going to go through all five of the offerings in Leviticus chapters 1 through 7 actually. Um, so we're going to talk about what the grain offering is, what it it signifies for us and then what it points to now we'll start in Leviticus chapter 2 and I already talked about how all these offerings point to one offering which was the Messiah who came and died on the cross for us and he fulfilled all these offerings perfectly and we needed all these different offerings to understand what he did for us so in verse 1 through 3 it says when anyone offers a grain offering to the Lord this offering shall be a fine flour. He will pour oil on it and put frankincense on it. He will bring it to Aaron's sons, the priest, one of whom shall take from it a handful of fine flour and oil with all the frankincense. The priest shall burn it as a memorial on the altar, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. The rest of the grain offering shall be Aaron and his sons. It is most holy of the offerings to the Lord made by fire. So the grain offering was typically fine flour mixed with oil and frankincense. A portion of the flour was burnt on the altar, and that was for the Lord, and then a portion was given for Aaron and his sons. As it says, the remainder of this offering will be for Aaron and his sons. So it would come to the priest in order to make their own bread to take care of their family. This flour was a staple for the people back then to be able to live and eat and have um, their food so we got to remember that Leviticus or the tribe of Levi was dedicated to the Lord so to speak now I'm not going to get too much into it but it was instead of all the firstborns God taking all the firstborns he allowed this tribe of Levi to be dedicated unto him for all the firstborn sons so they were dedicated to him in his service they took care of the temple they took care of all the utensils in the temple. You know, they were the ones that made the offerings. They were dedicated to the service of God. Now, all the other tribes had land that they could farm and they could have produce. They had animals that they could raise for food. So all the other tribes had a way to provide for themselves where the tribe of Levi didn't because all they did was um, service unto the Lord. So they relied on the other people bringing their offerings and as they stood as like a mediator between God and man they stood kind of almost as God to the people they would represent God so all the offerings given unto God they were to partake of so it's not that these people were giving offerings to a priest or to a, a man or to a people it was that they gave this offering to God but since they were representing God they got to share in that offering so the grain offering they would bring would be the flour and they would mix it with oil and frankincense. A portion of it on the altar, the remainder was given to the priest. This was, like I said, a main food that they lived off of. The one bringing the offering now was acknowledging God as their provider, as their source, the one that provides. It wasn't the work of their own hands. They were saying, God, we rely on you and we're giving this offering up to you because we are so thankful for what you have done because it takes God to provide they could work really hard all year and there still not be a harvest it would take God providing the rain providing the right conditions so it wasn't just man being able to do all that he can do to provide for himself it also took God so they're recognizing that God is a provider God is a source now this offering was regularly offered with animal sacrifices, but as we see here in Leviticus 2, it was also offered as an offering by itself, independently from that. The grain was wheat, and it was offered raw, cooked. It would be ground into fine flour and sometimes baked. Many scholars say that this grain offering it suggests a service unto God because it was the work of of man's hand it was the fruits of his labor it was the result of cultivation manufacturing preparation all this so it was a symbol of our service offered unto God 
So as we talk about the grain offering, think about it even in ways where you are doing an, a service unto God. So it's where the burnt offering was us giving ourselves completely unto God, our whole life. The grain offering kind of is talking about our service, our works that we do unto Him. Now, when we talk about works, we know that works is not what saves us. That's what Paul says, that we are saved by grace through faith, not of our works. So it's not our works that save us. But then James goes on to say that without faith or without works, what do we have? Our faith is dead if we don't show by works. So he says, you have faith? Well, I'll show you my faith by my works. So it's not our works that save us, but it's our service unto God that comes from a heart that is grateful and thankful that he gave us salvation, that he saved us, and that he did what we couldn't do. So now we offer our lives, we offer our service back unto him. There was three reasons for this grain offering. One, grains... And things that grow are of great necessity and benefit to man, especially in that agricultural society. It was a great benefit and it was a necessity. So it's appropriate to honor God with those things that he gives to us. The things that God gives us, we thank him by offering part of that back up to him. It brought necessary and helpful grain to the priest. So this is what I was talking about a little bit earlier that they couldn't produce on their own. The Levites were not allowed to just go out and cultivate the land, so they relied on the other tribes being able to bring stuff to them so that they would have food to eat. And even the poor could offer this offering. Many times you'll see, like, to bring a lamb. If you can't afford a lamb, then, you know, bring a bird. If you can't afford a bird, then bring grain. So God made a way for even the poor to be able to bring him an offering. He didn't want to exclude anybody from being able to bring and offer up this offering. Fine flour, when it talks about that, just meant it was sifted and purged from the bran, which was like that hard outer shell. So it was kind of, um, that outer shell was broken off and then it was sifted into fine flour. Now it says it was to be done with frankincense. This substance was usually used because it produced a pleasant odor when it was burned. Even when it was given with the burnt offering, you know, it wasn't like the necessarily the the smell of that burning animal that smelled good, but the frankincense and that on it would produce an aroma. It was very expensive and usually imported from an Arabian peninsula through Arabia. So it was only used mainly in like some type of ceremony. Now, tabernacle worship required frankincense to be used in its pure form. And we can read in Exodus 30, 30-38. says, You shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests. And you shall say to the people of Israel, This shall be my holy anointing oil throughout your generations. It shall not be poured on the body of an ordinary person, and you shall make no other like it in composition. It is holy, and it shall be holy unto you. So we see that this holy anointing oil was not to be poured on any ordinary people and you were not to make anything like it because it was holy. Whoever compounds any like it or whoever puts it on an outsider shall be cut off from his people. God wasn't messing around with this. So the Lord said to Moses, take sweet spices, I'm not sure how to pronounce all these, but stacked and oncha and galbanum, sweet spices with pure frankincense. Of each there should be an equal part. Make an incense blended as by the perfumer, seasoned with salt. So the salt is going to be important too. We're going to talk about salt in a minute. It is pure and holy. You shall beat some of it very small and put part of it before the testimony in the tent of meeting where I will meet with you. And it shall be most holy for you. And the incense that you shall make according to its composition, you shall not make for yourself. So this is something that was set apart. It was consecrated. It was holy. It says, it shall be for you holy to the Lord. Whoever makes any like it to use as a perfume shall be cut off. So we see if there was even unholiness to the things that was the frankincense was used for. It was placed on the table of showbread inside the holy place. So inside the holy place we had the lampstand or the menorah. We had the altar of incense and we had the table of showbread. Leviticus 24, 5-9 says, You shall take fine flour and bake twelve loaves from it. Two tenths of an epa shall be in each loaf. 
and you shall set them in two piles, six in a pile, on the table of pure gold before the Lord. You shall put pure frankincense on each pile, that it may go with the bread as a memorial portion, as a food offered to the Lord. Every Sabbath day Aaron shall arrange it before the Lord regularly. It is from the people of Israel as a covenant forever. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in the holy place. Since it is for him a most holy portion of the Lord's food offerings, a perpetual due. So these things that it was used in are holy. Frankincense always accompanies the grain offering, but not the sin offering and not the jealousy offering. Probably because of its association with the holiness and its association with joy. Song of Solomon 3.6 says, What is coming up from the wilderness like columns of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the fragrant powders of a merchant? Isaiah 66 says, a mul 60 verse 6, A people shall come, or I'm sorry, A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Epha, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense, and bring good news, the praises of the Lord. And then Jeremiah 17 verse 26 says, And people shall come from the cities of Judah and the places around Jerusalem, from the land of Benjamin, from the Shephelah, from the hill country, from the Negev, bringing burnt offerings and sacrifices, grain offerings and frankincense, and thank offerings to the house of the Lord. So, Nehemiah 13.12 tells us the tithes of the wine, the, the wine, the wine, the grain, and the oil were stored in these special rooms. So they were so important that these things were stored in special rooms in the temple. The wine, the grain, and the oil. A memorial on the altar, an offering made by fire, a sweet smelling aroma unto the Lord. God allowed and received this bloodless sacrifice. So many of the sacrifices would deal with sin and they would be there would be blood involved, whether it be the killing of an animal, you know, or the bird, whatever. There would be some kind of blood that would be sprinkled on the altar or whatever. But here, this was a bloodless offering because it didn't have to do with sin. It had to do with a thankful heart unto God and our service unto God. It was for thanksgiving, not atonement. And most people, they were living in this agricultural, agrarian society, so everything they did had to do with, you know, this, this grain and this wheat. It was very important, and it was a fitting symbol of giving thanks to God for what He had done for them. When God provides, we give back a portion of that. It said it was the most holy of the offerings to the Lord made by fire. The emphasis on the grain offering was our service, but also thankfulness, gratitude. It was called the most holy of the offerings, showing a high regard God has for our thankfulness. Sometimes we're not even aware that the value that God puts on just our gratitude unto Him. I believe it's a holy thing unto Him. And... It says in Psalms 100, verse 4, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. So we enter into God's presence through thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a door that allows us to walk into God's presence. So then it says, Give thanks to him and bless his name. So not only does it allow us to enter in his presence, it opens up those that gate so that we can walk in. But when we're there, what the first thing it says is give thanks to him and bless his name. So thanksgiving and a heart of gratitude is something that is truly, truly holy unto God. Just like we read in Romans 12, 1, that when we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, it is our true worship. It's a holy thing. Now when we give thanks and honor to him and we do service out of a pure heart, it's also a holy thing. There were different types of grain offerings in verse 4 through 10. It says, If you bring an offering, a grain offering baked in the oven, it shall be unleavened cakes of fine flour mixed with oil, or unleavened wafers anointed with oil. But if your offering is a grain offering baked in a pan, it shall be a fine flour, unleavened, mixed with oil. You shall break it in pieces and pour oil on it. It is a grain offering. If your offering is a grain offering baked in a covered pan, it shall be made of fine flour with oil. You will bring the grain offering that is made of these things to the Lord. And when it is presented to the priest, he will bring it to the altar. Then the priest shall take the grain offering, a memorial portion, and burn it on the altar. 
is an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. And what is left of the grain offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. It is the most holy of the offerings to the Lord made by fire. So if you bring an offering as a grain offering baked in an oven, this grain offering could be fine flour already baked. It could be cooked on a flat griddle. It could be prepared in like a covered pan. But no matter what form it was in, it was to be made at home. So just think back to like the women back then making these cakes or making these what look like dumplings. Um, as they were preparing it in their home, out of a pure heart, wanting to give God an offering, their best that they had. And they present it to God as a sacrifice. This expression of devotion began at home, and that's something that we can't overlook. It was offered with the right heart, but it was offered at home. So our service begins in our home. Our thankfulness should begin in our home. Sometimes we want to go out and win the world for Jesus, and that's great, but our home's a mess. Sometimes, you know, we want to be used by God out in the marketplace, but we don't want to be used by God at home. So our home is our first mission field. And, you know, we want to go out and we want to evangelize sometimes. We want to go on mission trips. We want to go do all this, which is good things. But yet, it starts at home. Get your home life right. That way, when you go out, you will be effective. I believe that you're not going to be as effective out there witnessing to the multitudes if your home life is a mess. It always begins at home. The covered pan worked like a deep fryer. They, they say that... The grain offering cooked in the covered pan would look like kind of a, a fried donut, like our modern fried donut. Whereas the ones that are, are, they can deep fry them or boil them and it'd be kind of like a dumpling style. But it says there are unleavened cakes. <clears throat> and in Leviticus 2.11 it talks about how God doesn't want leaven or yeast in the grain offering. Now this was a picture of sin, corruption. Um, yeast had kind of like a corrupting influence. And to many it symbolized that corruption, sin, pride. And then it also says that he didn't want honey burned on the altar. Now honey was used in many pagan um, cults that they would worship their deities with and they would use honey. So God says, I don't want you to worship me like they worship their gods. And honey well, is kind of like a symbol for man's desires also. And I know that honey can uh, kind of point to the word of God, but in many instances it talks to, like, it speaks to man's desire as a sensuality kind of. The Canaanites have many occultic rituals that involve honey, and God says, I don't want you to have any kind of participation in anything like that. I don't want you to do something that's going to resemble what those other nations are doing, worshiping their gods. This honey was probably syrup from fruit, not the product of bees, kind of like what we think about when we think of honey. So there was fermentation, there was still decay. Honey and yeast could be offered as first fruits, but they could not be offered on the altar. There was different guidelines from things that you could offer on the altar as opposed to other types of offering. The first fruit was the first portion of that harvest and viewed as the, the best. So whatever would come up first, we offer to God because one, it's the first and it's the best. So there's kind of like a trust thing going on there saying, I'm gonna give you the first animal that's born from this animal. And that's trusting God that there will be more that's born from that animal. Um, I'm going to give you the first of this harvest, trusting that you're going to bring in more, and you're going to bless all the rest of it. And many times the Israelites, as the, it would grow up, the grain or something would grow, they would tie a ribbon on that to mark, this is the first. So then when the rest of the crop grew up and was ready to be harvested, they would take that that was already marked, and they would give it unto God. So what was marked from beforehand, they would give unto God as a first fruit offering. We see that Cain and Abel, we see these different type of offerings. It says in Genesis 4, 3 through 5, In the course of time, Cain, br Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and the fat portion. 
The Lord re had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was angry and fell on his face. So it said that Cain brought to the Lord an offering. It doesn't say he brought the first. It doesn't say he brought the best. He just brought an offering of the fruit of the ground, where Abel brought the firstborn of the flock. So Abel brought the first fruit, and God respected that offering, but he didn't have respect for Cain's offering. And uh, there's more to that story that I don't want to get in because it will sidetrack us, but I'm convinced that if we will follow the first fruits command that God will just do amazing things in our life. And, you know, not that he doesn't do those things for us in areas, but man, the first fruit is something that I believe opens the door for God to just bless you in different ways. If we give him, think about it, if we give him the first part of our day, then that allows him to have the rest of our day and to be able to to move and to interact with us and to do things that maybe normally we wouldn't if we just jump up and run headlong into our day if we take that time in the morning to set it set aside with god and say here i am you know lord i welcome you into my day and we begin to tune into him and enter into his presence early on then that will dictate the rest of the, the day the same same way with our our weeks our months our years I think it's important that we start the year off right that we start the month off right that we do these different things in order but also with the things that he's blessed us with we give him the first and the best we don't give him leftovers and that goes back to ourselves. we don't give him the leftovers of us after we've already given part of us here and part of us there and part of us there but we take the first part of even our energy and of ourselves you know symbolically we take the first of us and give it to God as that offering and we don't give ourselves to all these different things and then we come back to God with all right I don't have much left God but here it is that's not what God wants going back to the leaven Jesus spoke of leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees in Matthew 16 6 through 12 you can read that on your own the leaven of Herod in Mark 8 15 and he talks about their doctrines, their corrupt philosophies. Paul spoke of old leaven of corruption and sin in 1 Corinthians 5, 6-9. The leaven of the Pharisees was hypocrisy. They had the ritualism, but not without the moral content. They didn't have the true relationship with God that they were putting on for many people. The leaven of the Sadducees was kind of like a, a rationalism or a worldliness where they wanted to eliminate the supernatural they didn't want to believe in they didn't believe in angels or the resurrection and things like that even though the pharisees did so the pharisees believed in the supernatural but yet they had an outward show an outward form of godliness but they denied the power whereas the sadducees wouldn't even believe in the supernatural so they were more worldly Paul speaks of the leaven of malice and wickedness as opposed to sincerity and truth. So these corrupting influences are not to be mixed in with our service to God. And yes, we can be used in many ways, mighty by God, even with problems in our life. I'm not saying that. But God doesn't expect us to just be content with these things in our life. He wants us to rid ourselves of them so that we can offer up a pure service, sometimes we do things with wrong motives. You know, not saying everybody does, but there's a lot of times that people do things for attention. They put it on social media, paying for this person's meal. They put it on, you know, Facebook and Instagram and all that when they do something good so that people will give them a pat on the back and say, wow, look what you just did. Not everybody. Some people probably do it so they can say, you know, this is what the church should be doing. But some people do it for attention. I mean, that's just the way it is. They want people to say, hey, good job, or you're so sweet. You got such a not a caring heart, you know, so they put it out there. And that's what the Pharisees did. They wanted to be noticed by others. They wanted other people to see how, you know, how much they loved God, even though their words might have been right. Their actions may have been right, but their heart was far from him. So... We don't want hypocrisy, materialism, um, strife, or you know, wrong motives to be the reason that we do these things. So 
If our grain offering is a picture of service to God, it also shows that we fall short in serving God as we should. Many times we know God has called us to do something and we don't do it. Maybe it's out of embarrassment. Maybe we just don't feel good enough. You know, whatever the reason may be, we feel called by God to do something, but yet we don't do it. Maybe we feel, in, you know, insecurities like keep us from doing it or whatever the case may be. But we can be grateful that Jesus fulfilled this offering and the heart and the meaning of the offering because he lived his life in service to the Father. He says, whatever the Father says, that's what I'm going to do. Whatever he does, that's what I do. And he's like, I don't act on my own accord, but only what I see the Father do. So Jesus fulfilled this grain offering. He fulfilled the burnt offering by giving himself completely over for that sacrifice. And he fulfilled the grain offering by complete devotion and service to God, to his Father, to our Father. Now going back to 11 one more time, because I keep getting off on these sidetracks, but leaven just a little bit can leaven the whole lump. Sorry, the bird's talking over here. A little bit can infect a whole batch. So it starts off small, but then it puffs up and it rises up and it goes throughout the whole batch, even just a little bit. And many ancient Israelites would leaven their dough by just taking a pinch off of the old dough and putting it in with the new batch. And then even that little pinch would completely consume the new batch and leaven the whole thing. So without leaven, you have just a flat bread, right? Like the matzah bread. If we don't have leaven, it's just flat. But you put a little bit of leaven in it and it puffs up the whole thing. So, and it just takes a little bit. Like they would just take a pinch off an already leavened piece and put it in with all that new dough and it would leaven the whole thing. So that's kind of how we see that it comes in and it, it kind of takes over and it puffs up. So it's a picture of, of the corruptness of sin, that little bit that can corrupt the whole thing. Or, you know, the, the pride, how it swells up. So, and, you know, we, you hear a lot of people that will mention, like, you know, if I had a glass of water and I just put a little bit of drop of something in it that's, that's not good for you, say, you know, acid or sewage or, you know, whatever it may be, you're not going to drink that because that little bit has infected that entire glass. And it's the same way with sin in our life. If we give way to even just a little bit of sin and think it's okay to have that in our life and we're not praying about it, we're not repenting, we're not crying out to God to come and help us, that little bit of sin can infect our whole life. We think nobody knows about this. I'll keep it off in the back corner. I'm still living most of my life, you know, godly, God-fearing people. When people look at me, they see someone that loves God. I'm just going to keep this off in the back corner. But that back corner that thing is going to corrupt your entire life. And you've got to be careful about just trying to keep things hidden and allowing them in our life. Now, it's one thing if there's an addiction and we're praying and we're crying out to God and we're asking for help, but when we're just content with it being there, it's going to make its way in and it's going to corrupt our entire life. Bread with leaven was a part of the peace offering, but not part of this the offerings offered on the altar. It was not to be burnt by fire. So honey and leaven could be offered, it just could not be offered on the altar. We can come to God the way we are, but God wants us to clean, he wants to help us get cleaned up. It's called that sanctification process. When we come to God and we're saved, we're justified, but then we go through a sanctification period, meaning we walk with him and he begins to tell us, let's remove this out of your life. Well, God, I can't. And God's like, well, I can. Let me help you. So he begins to change us, and we become more and more like Jesus. When I first got saved, like immediately I stopped cussing. I used to cuss all the time, like every other word. And when I got saved, almost immediately, like I stopped cussing. And I haven't for 14 years, except maybe a couple slips back when I was, you know, younger in the Lord. But now, like, it's not even a part of my vocabulary. I don't have to not try to cuss. 
You know, it's just not part of my vocabulary because he changed that in me. I used to listen to heavy metal and, and rap and really, you know, some, some other music that was definitely not glorifying God. And when he first asked me to give that up, it was hard because that was, I mean, I loved music. That was my life. And when he's like, throw all your CD, remember back when we had those CD cases that were like that tall and I had hundreds and hundreds of CDs and God said, throw them away. And I'm like, what? Like I almost cried as I put them in the trash can. But as I walked with him, he began changing that to now I don't even want to listen to secular music. Now all I want to listen to is music that glorifies him. So sometimes it's a process, sometimes it's immediate, but there's a sanctification as we walk with him, which is just like a fancy word for being set apart. As God, as we walk with him, some things he takes away and we don't even have to struggle with. Other things we may have to, to work it out with him and pray and to really fast and seek him to get rid of certain things in our life. But he gives us a desire to not want those things anymore. Like I couldn't even believe that now there are things I don't want that was such a huge part of my life back then. But it was him changing my heart and changing my desires and giving me new desires. So it's just awesome that we can come to him how we are and he will still use us. He was even using pagan kings and stuff, but yet he wants us to walk with him and get these things removed out of our life. Honey was not allowed again because one, it was a favorite thing to sacrifice to pagan deities, those small g gods. He didn't want to be worshipped that way. And also, that God's worship is not governed by men's desires or something we see as sweet and delectable. Leaven can make things artificially sour, whereas honey can make things artificially sweet. God didn't want either one of these things in sacrifice to him. When we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, Romans 1 and 2, he wants us to come as we are without having to make ourselves anything that we're not. We can come to him knowing that there's a lot of messed up stuff in our life, but we don't have to say, I'm going to clean this up before I come to you, God. We can come as we are, and he will work with us, just like I was saying, to remove those things out of our life. It's not up to us to have to clean all this stuff up and become better before God can use us. Leaven, the symbol of pride and self. Honey, that which is attractive and sensuous. Remember, it was the honey that seduced, so to speak, Samson to break part of his Nazarite vow and to touch that dead body because he saw the honey and he reached in and he got some, even though he was not supposed to touch that dead body. We are also reminded that as the believers in the Old Testament times offered a grain, this grain to God, Jesus Christ is the bread of life. He is the one that offers life. John 6, 32 through 35, Jesus is called the bread of life. He is the grain offering. Yeshua, Jesus, is the picture of the burnt offering, giving himself completely over as an offering, as a sacrifice. And the grain offering here, he dedicates his whole life in service to the Father and what the Father's will is. He says, I have come to do the will of the Father over and over. I have come to do the will of the Father. And that should be our heart's cry too. I have come to do the will of the Father. What is that? You get in your word and you find out and then you do it. You offer yourself up as that grain offering saying, I've come to do the will of the Father. Jesus said to them in John 5:19, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. And many times in John, he says, I've come to do the will of the Father. The grain offerings needed oil with them. This was practical helping with the binding of the flour together. So you pour oil on it and you could clump it together. And then it would help it to burn properly. And it was, it's a symbolic also the fact that our service needs to be mixed with the power and the presence, the influence of Holy Spirit. As many times in the Bible we see that oil represents Holy Spirit. We should always allow Him to kind of go with us, work with us, work through us in the the offering the grain offering was brought as flour prepared bread you know whatever portion was burnt on the altar a portion went to the priest and then we have the first fruits offering 
It says, you shall offer them to the Lord, but they shall not be burned on the altar for a sweet aroma, talking about the leaven and the honey. As for offering the first fruits, the best and the first of the harvest was the first fruits. They were not to be burned on the altar. They were offered in a different procedure. God had a different procedure for the first fruits than the grain offerings in general, described in Leviticus 2, 14 through 16. And every offering, a grain offering, it says, you shall season with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of God to be lacking from your grain offering. With all the offerings, you shall offer salt. That was verse 13. Salt was an important part of the offering. One, because it spoke of purity, preservation, and expense, or is costly. Every sacrifice we offer to God needs to be pure, enduring, and should cost us something. Don't offer God something that didn't cost you something. And it should last. In this verse, God repeated the command three times. Verse 13. Anything we offer to God should be done with pure motives. Don't just do something because you feel like you should. Like you're checking off a box, but yet your motives are wrong. God would rather you not do it than you do it with wrong motives. And... When we offer God something, don't take it back. Offer it to Him and then just be grateful and thankful that you even have that to offer. Salt was a preservative which would slow or stop the process of decay. Or, um, it, you know, they didn't have refrigerators like we do now to where we can slow down that process, but they would use salt that would preserve things. We are to be the salt of the earth, Matthew 5.13. We are to slow or stop the decay of the world. Is that part of what you feel called to do? Because it is. We are the salt of the earth, and it is for us to pray and to go out and do these good works to slow and stop the decay of this world because this world is decaying quickly. It is doing it right in front of our eyes, but it is up to us to go out there and to slow that down and to stop that, allowing Holy Spirit to work through us, allowing God to work through us, to slow and to stop the decay of this world. And salt also spoke of a friendship. A bond of friendship was established through the eating of salt. It was said that once you eat someone's salt, you are their friend for life. God wanted every sacrifice to be a reminder of this relationship, this enduring relationship that would last forever. My wife and I did a salt covenant to where we had two separate vials of salt and we poured them in a third vial and mixed them together and it was said that if we could separate every grain out of there from what's mine and from what was hers and put them back in their original vials, then, only then, could the marriage end. Obviously, that's impossible. You can't separate salt once it's put together like that. Once it's mixed together, you cannot separate it and identify it. So that salt mixing together is our lives mixing together, which cannot now be separated, for it is eternally mixed together. God commanded sacrifices not to be eaten with honey, Leviticus 2.11, and commanded to include salt. Exclude honey, include salt. God wants sincerity of our service, not things that are just artificially sweet. Charles Spurgeon once said, There is a kind of molasses godliness which I cannot stomach. The fact that God commanded every offering should include salt shows that even the small things matter in our service to God. He's worried about even the small details. Our faithfulness in small things will honor God. Sometimes we allow the small things to go and we think we only need to be faithful in the big things. But God doesn't see it that way. He says, I want you to be faithful even in the small things. That honors me. When you can be faithful to one instead of only thinking you need to be faithful to ten, that honors God. When you can be faithful in the things that nobody else sees and also be faithful in the things that everybody sees, that matters to God. So even the small things matter. Now the covenant of salt has special characteristics. It was a pure covenant because salt stays pure as a chemical compound. It was enduring because salt preserves and causes things to endure. And it was valuable because salt was expensive. Salt is a preservative. It symbolizes a notion that that covenant cannot, will not be destroyed by fire or decay. The phrase covenant of salt emphasizes the durability 
and that eternality of the covenant. The idea of salt is represented in Numbers 18, 19, and 2 Chronicles 13, 5. It says, with all your offerings, offer salt. Jesus spoke to this idea of salt and sanctification and sacrifice in Mark 9, 49 through 50. And he said that people, as living sacrifices to God, would be seasoned with fire and with salt. Because salt spoke of so many things as covenant, fellowship, purity, sincerity. It says that when we offer our offerings, we do it seasoned with salt. In sincerity, purity, we remember the fellowship, the covenant that was being made. So then to end 14 through 16, if you offer a grain offering of first fruits to the Lord, you shall offer for the grain offering of your first fruits green heads of grain roasted on the fire, grain beaten from full heads, and you shall put oil on it and lay frankincense on it. It is a grain offering. Then the priest shall burn the memorial portion, part of it beaten grain and parts of it with oil, with all the frankincense as an offering made by fire to the Lord. In Leviticus 2.12, God told Israel not to bring first fruits offering in the same manner as you do the grain offering. He told them here how to bring the first fruits offering. The idea of first fruits is very important. And I believe it's something that we all need to take into consideration in our own life to be aware that God honors the first fruits. The first of the harvest, the first of the livestock, they all belong to the Lord. That's even where the idea of the tribe of Levi came from. Now, this could be risky, say, I'm going to give God the first of this, because what if there's no more? Are we going to be okay with that, that we gave God an offering and now we don't have anything? But we trust Him. It's a trust exercise, knowing that He's going to provide. I don't have to worry. I can give Him the best. I can give Him the first. And I don't have to worry because I'm still going to have more than enough. I'm going to have everything I need. The Lord promises to bless the giving of the firstborn and the first fruits in faith. Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. So if you want your barns to be filled with plenty and your vats to overflow with new wine, he says, give me the first fruits. We honor him with everything that we have. We honor him by giving the first fruits, the first and the best. Your barns then will be filled, meaning you will have everything that you have need of. You don't have to worry. That's a key scripture that we should be praying. God, I want to honor you with my first fruits. And I know that your word says that you will bless me and my barns will be filled with plenty. My vats will overflow with new wine. I will have, and wine can speak of joy. And the barn being that storehouse, we have all that we have need of. All we got to do is honor God. If we try to make things happen and we try to work hard and make a, a living for ourselves, and, you know, we just try to work, work, work so that we can gain funds and all this other stuff, then a lot of times we fall short. But if we honor God and we give unto him what rightfully belongs to him, then he gives us everything else anyway. It says you should put oil on it and frankincense to sweeten the sacrifice, make it costlier. Remember, oil is representative of the Holy Spirit, so everything we do, we do as unto the Lord and with a sense of joy. An offering made by fire. We see Jesus in his life and work fulfilled the grain offering. He fulfilled the first fruit offering. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 presents Jesus as the first fruits of the resurrection the first of God's new order of resurrected life. Our service unto the Lord to be done in purity and honor, doing everything, like it says in Colossians, that we do everything as unto the Lord, whether we eat or drink. No matter what you do, you do it honoring Him. We give of our first fruits, and we do it out of sincerity and a pure heart, knowing that He is worthy. Regardless of anything else, he is worthy of our best. So that's what the grain offering is all about. So as you think about this, the first two offerings, the burnt offering, which if you haven't seen that video, please watch that because that talks about us giving ourselves wholly unto God as a, an offering. Galatians 2.20, it is not I that live, but Christ lives in me, and I allow him to live through me. And now with the grain offering, that our service 
is offered to God as a holy thing, that we work for him and we do the works so that people can see God in us and through us and they will come to him. They will see his light through us as we do the works of the Father. Jesus said, I've come to do the will of my Father and we need to do the same thing. We come to do the will of our Father so that one, what he wants done on earth will get accomplished and two, that so people can see Jesus in us. Sometimes people aren't going to hear us preach, but they will see our actions. And people watch you. And if your actions aren't lining up with what you're preaching, the things that you're telling them, and then you do something different, they're not going to want to hear it. So we come to do the works of the Father in sincerity and with a true heart, with pure motives. That is our grain offering unto the Lord. So thank you for being with us. We will move on to Leviticus chapter 3 and move on through the offerings and hopefully you can see that even something that sometimes we read through and we think is boring or just trying to get through it so we can say yeah I read that is actually packed full of wisdom and packed full of of revelation that can even help us in our own life so until next time I just pray the Lord bless you and keep you and that his face would shine upon you in Jesus name